Coming up on the FSR Sark Fighter podcast, it's summer 2023. What's a guy got to do to get some rest and relaxation around here? Also, a former guest on the podcast wins a major grant to study one of the most deadly forms of sarcoidosis. It's all coming up on the FSR Sark Fighter podcast. This is the Sark Fighter podcast, living with sarcoidosis and other rare diseases. Here's your host, John Carlin. Hello and welcome. This is episode 95 of the FSR Sark Fighter podcast. I'm your host, John Carlin. This episode brought to you by Atire Pharmaceuticals. On the heels of their successful phase two clinical trial, Atire Pharma has launched a phase three clinical trial in pulmonary sarcoidosis. The study will test whether efsofitamod, which is the drug that has been produced by ATIRE will allow people to reduce the dose of steroids they are taking to treat their disease while maintaining symptom control and preserving lung function. Please go back and listen to episode 65 of the FSR Sark Fighter podcast with ATIRE Pharma's president and CEO, Dr. Sanjay Shukla, to learn more. And there's a link in the show notes if you'd like to sign up to become a part of that clinical trial. All right, I am just back from what was supposed to be a relaxing vacation at our family cabin in Vermont, uh, which means a couple of things. Number one, I have not scheduled a guest for this week because I've been too busy focusing on my vacation. Uh, But I will tell you that I've been in touch with the team at FSR and we've been emailing back and forth and I have some amazing guests in the pipeline who are researching some of the latest techniques to fight sarcoidosis and, and or maybe doing what they can to learn about how it works in the body. But so I've got at least four people now that I uh, am talking to FSR about having on the podcast who are sort of cutting edge people in the sarcoidosis space. And I know that you'll be very excited to hear those as we move through fall and uh, actually maybe even to early winter with the podcasts. But I'm very excited about those. And uh, and then also I want you to um, to look for a couple of those episodes to begin rolling out maybe as early as September of 2023. So in the next month or so, as I'm recording this in late August of 2023. And meanwhile, I want to report to you that Dr. Christian Vatz, who appeared in episode 77 of the Sark Fighter podcast, has received a $150,000 grant from the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Now, Dr. Vatz is at the University of Illinois Hospital and Clinic in Chicago, and her proposal for the grant was titled Immune Mediators of Active Advanced Pulmonary Sarcoidosis. And I just want to read you some bits now from the news release that talks a little bit about what she is doing. First of all, I should give you a little background and let you know that FSR has awarded over $1.2 million dollars through their fellowship grant program uh, over the past few years. And this is basically a, a way to continue FSR's investment in support of promising early career investigators. Now, what does that mean? Well, I've, I've talked to enough people at FSR that I can tell you generally what they do is, you know, there, there are not a ton of doctors out there studying sarcoidosis. And what FSR is doing is identifying and or encouraging young doctors like Dr. Vatz to say, hey, you're looking for a pathway for your career. Why not sarcoidosis? And a large number of them have said yes. And so they'll, they'll start their studies. Uh, and this is a way that, that we hope, um, speaking on behalf of FSR, uh, that these young doctors will stay with sarcoidosis and will continue to encourage Uh, more and more young doctors to get into uh, work with SARC and to then continue their careers and therefore we just grow the number of doctors who are working on it. Um, But this FSR fellowship grant 
uh, provides an opportunity for early stage investigators to develop specialized skills and gain direct experience within the field of sarcoidosis. So that's the official language from the news release. And uh, Dr. Vatz is quoted here. She says, I'm so honored to be the recipient of the FSR Fellowship Grant. And then she says, improved understanding of how sarcoidosis-related inflammation drives pulmonary fibrosis is critical for new drug development and the creation of clinical strategies to help mitigate the risk of advanced lung fibrosis. And so um, her research uh, initiatives stem directly from clinical experiences managing patients with SARC at UIC's Bernie Mac Sarcoidosis Translational Advanced Research Center, which is known as STAR, Translational uh, Sarcoidosis Translational Advanced Research Center. Uh, and she has embarked on that in her research career at the, uh, at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic and then evaluated the causes of sarcoidosis by focusing her attention on immunology. And I can tell you that advanced pulmonary sarcoidosis-related fibrosis, also known as APSF, I hate acronyms, but if, I guess if you're in a hurry and you need to just talk about it, you call it APSF. But it does occur in up to 30% of those with pulmonary sarc and does carry significant morbidity and mortality rates. So Dr. Vat's project will seek to identify potential genetic factors and inflammatory biomarkers that increase the risk of the potential development of advanced lung disease in sarcoidosis patients. And then just very briefly, and this, this gets over my head pretty quickly, but and maybe yours too, Dr. Vatz plans to apply gene sequencing techniques and a strategy that uses advanced software to understand and analyze complex data sets called bioinformatics to explore how changes in the immunological systems and cells may lead to sarcoidosis-related pulmonary fibrosis. And so congratulations to Dr. Vatz. I will see if Dr. Vatz is maybe interested in coming back on the podcast. I remember having had a good conversation with her last time, and maybe she would be willing to come back. But on the other hand, maybe we don't want to slow her down because she's doing some pretty advanced research. And you know, when you look at all these things that they're doing with computers and whatnot, maybe, maybe it's best that it's the, it's the young doctors who are doing that. Uh, and I'm sure the old doctors can handle it just fine. I'm not, I'm not picking on them. But whenever I hear uh, about people using technology, and which is the, is the word, you know, when you, say, you hear people say tech, I usually think of advanced computer stuff, or, you know, maybe not even advanced, but just day to day computer stuff, but it's changing so fast that it's, it's hard for me to keep up even with Facebook anymore, sometimes just knowing where to click and that kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm getting off track. I, I, I'm so glad that congratulations to Dr. Vatz and I'm so glad that, that she is doing this and that FSR has given her the $150,000. That'll be spread out over two years. And let's hope that um, after that research is done, that we are, are working, are, are, are ever closer to, uh, to finding a cure or some solutions for sarcoidosis. Uh, another couple of notes I've heard back from Royce Robertson. Uh, if you've been listening to the last few episodes, you know that he was in the midst of a fundraising bike ride on the Empire Trail in New York State. It was a, a three-day ride riding uh, from Buffalo to Rochester, New York. And he just wrote to say uh, that he completed the ride and he's anxious to share the details about it with you, the listeners, as well as uh, to give an update on how the money is coming in because it was a fundraiser. Uh, if you remember, he had originally scheduled to do the ride and then the smoke from the Canadian wildfires started coming down into New York State to the point where, as a sarcoidosis patient, his doctor said, you, you don't need to be out there. You know, exercising is is about as far as we want to push your body, riding your bike like that. So let's not do it in the smoke on top of that. So he pushed it back a couple of times and worked around his schedule, and he, he has finished the bike ride. So we'll be hearing from Royce uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. 
uh, although he, he does work in higher education, and this is a very busy time right now. The students are just coming back to campus, and it's all about scheduling. But as soon as I can get Royce in front of a microphone and we can have a conversation, we'll have an update on that bike ride. And I'm really curious to hear how things went, how his body held up, and you know, sarcoidosis reared its ugly head at all uh, during that trip, or, or if he was able to, to take it easy and, and just get it done. Well, we'll find out. A couple of episodes ago, episode 93, I talked to you a little bit about my trip to cover the Virginia National Guard troops who were deployed on the Mexican border in Texas, where they were working to deter migrants from crossing the Rio Grande River into the United States. And I was there for all of that. I mentioned at the time that it was over 100 degrees every day that we were there, basically three days on the ground. And physically, that was certainly a test of my health in a, you know, in my sarcoidosis world. You guys know that I take care of myself, right? I, I, I eat well for the most part. I, I stay physically fit by riding my bike, working out in the gym occasionally. But when you get to extremes like that, the, the stress from the heat, the reporting, uh, observing, trying to find the story while you're there. You've got three days. You want to, you want to, you know, if there's a, a flare up, if there's some excitement in that area that we're covering, you want to get to it while it's happening. You want to record it on camera. You want to interview the various players. You, you you want to find those pieces of human drama that will um, that will make the best story and best illustrate what's happening at the border. And so you're doing all that in the heat and then you're bouncing around in the backseat of a pickup truck and the dust down there was just amazing. When this was dust where you would step in it and it was somewhere between sand and just plain dust and your foot would go down sometimes like four inches in this stuff and just big plumes of dust if you were just walking would be coming up around your feet. Well, imagine with the constant stream of four-wheel drives passing back and forth on basically the only road right there next to the river. And if you're standing there, you get, they call it getting dusted, and that's exactly what happens. I've got some some great pictures of it. But um, those are the types of things where if there is a weakness in your body, in your immune system, whatever, it'll rise to the surface, right? It, it'll It'll expose itself, as it were. But I'm happy to say right now that um, I managed it well. I told you that when I talked about it on that particular podcast. And now a month later, near as I can tell, I've got no lingering issues. So uh, that is good. Uh, I'm now slogging through the hours of the footage and the interviews to put together a one-hour special for WSLS 10, the TV station where I work. And that's a different kind of stress, let me tell you that. But at least I can do that in the air conditioning. So uh, I do have that. All right. This is kind of an interesting aside. I was watching the CBS Sunday morning show this morning, and they had on a fascinating, fascinating story about lightning, everything you ever wanted to know about lightning. In fact, they had this expert on there who said, when you see lightning, it looks like it's coming from the cloud to the sky. But by the time you see it, it's actually uh, on its return trip to the cloud, and the guy said that it's actually um, what you're seeing is from the ground up. Um, okay, one one interesting takeaway. But the the part that stuck with me was that they interviewed a woman who had been struck by lightning and survived. Actually, she was standing under the roof of a small shed which was next to the lighting for a soccer field, and the lightning hit the lighting structure, but then transferred through the ground and got her that way. And so so she wasn't hit directly by the lightning bolt, but she suffered a pretty big blow, and she talked about it and talked about how it really messed her up. She she talked about... um, uh, how her she couldn't remember names. You know, her brain was basically rewired because uh, when you think about it, your brain and your heart essentially are uh, they operate on electronic pulses, right? And when the lightning enters your body, that's a big electronic pulse, and some people get rewired when they get hit by lightning. So. This woman started searching around online, and she found a group of other people who had also been 
hit by lightning and they started talking to each other and now they meet in person every once in a while someplace in the United States and they've formed a support group because they have all these crazy things going on in their bodies. So here's some of the things they listed. All right, now pay attention here because this is important. Neuropathy, heart damage, brain damage, three things that, that came right out of the, at, at, at the very top. And they talked about how nobody knows their plight because it isn't visible. So if you pass that guy in the store, if you see that woman at a party, you don't know that they are suffering from the effects of having been hit by lightning. And they said that they needed one another because of that fact, right? They said it, it's, it's, it's hard because they didn't know anybody else who'd been struck by lightning and could share their thoughts and feelings and could sort of empathize and sympathize where it was appropriate and just how hard it was to deal with it. People didn't, all right, you hear me? People didn't know they had it. They couldn't find anybody else who had it or had suffered this, and they found it very difficult to talk about it with regular people. Hmm. Hmm. Does that sound familiar to you, sarcoidosis patients? Right? How many times have we heard that? How many times have I talked about it? I mean, I have neuropathy. Uh, we've had people on who've had brain damage. Certainly have had a number of pulmonary cases, right? So, uh, and then brain damage can happen. It, it does happen in neurosarcoidosis. So all these things that they were talking about are the same things that SARC patients talk about. And how many people have reached out to me and said, thank you for the podcast because I don't know anybody else who has sarcoidosis. So uh, I just thought it was interesting that now we can compare ourselves collectively to those people who have been hit by lightning. <laughs> not, not, a, not a great group to, um, I, I mean, I'm laughing, it's not funny. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's, the, there's all of these things about, you know, you're, you're less like, you're more likely to be hit by lightning than you are to be bitten by a shark. And everybody talks about how rare it is to be hit by lightning. And then here is this group of people and they have the same sentiments, feelings, and issues that those of us with sarcoidosis do. It might be interesting to do a comparison. How many people have sarcoidosis, which in the United States is about 200,000 and how many people get hit by lightning throughout the course of their lifetime and are still living. So if there's 200,000 people with sarcoidosis, how many people in the United States um, are walking around having been hit by lightning? And I wonder which group is larger. And probably that's something you can figure out, but that's just something that came to me as I was sitting here talking to you. Uh, but at any rate, I just thought that that might be an interesting aside that you would enjoy. All right, coming up, the North Wind aging parents, and a lot of mud. Not the best vacation ever. I feel like a zombie Just feeding and stumbling Hi, I hope you're enjoying the Sark Fighter Podcast. You may be wondering, what can I do to help? How can I be a part of the sarcoidosis solution? It's simple. Make a donation to KISS. Kick in to stop sarcoidosis. 100% of the money goes to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Look for a link in the show notes of the Sark Fighter Podcast. Welcome back to the FSR Sark Fighter Podcast. John Carlin with you here in late August of 2023, and I hope you've been having a great summer. Technically, I guess we have about another month of summer, but Labor Day is almost upon us. Uh, kids are back in school here locally. The college kids have already gone back to many of the colleges, and the days are getting shorter in the evening, so it kind of feels like summer is over. Um, but let me just tell you a little bit about what's been going on with me, and I'll give you a bit of sarcoidosis perspective on that uh, towards the end of my little story here. But since I was about 11 years old, my family 
has been doing our vacations at a small cabin in Addison, Vermont. It's on Lake Champlain. Um, calling it a cabin is generous. It's it's really more of a camp. It's not winterized. It's only for summer use, and it's rough. I will tell you that uh, it has electricity and it has running water, uh, but that's that's about it. For instance, the um, there are two bedrooms. I, I think the whole camp is probably 900 square feet. Uh, so there's a kitchen, there's a living room, and there's two bedrooms. Um, but like if you go into the bedrooms, the, they're only defined by the fact that there's a curtain on the door. Like there's not a door door, okay? Uh, the furniture is old, which is appropriate because you're going to come in there in you know, wet clothes after playing in the lake. or The children are going to be in there, so it's not like you want the nicest stuff but you know it's old it's old furniture i mean the, the cushions aren't torn or anything but um you know yeah you, you get what i'm talking about now here's the thing the, the camp also does have a bathroom including a shower and a toilet however if you watched the news at all you may have noticed that vermont has had record amounts of rain this summer. I mean a lot of rain. Uh, they, they had flooding. Uh, they were to the point where bridges were washed out, cars were washed away. It was really, really bad about a month before we got there. And a lot of those waterways flow into Lake Champlain and Lake Champlain itself got a lot of water. And so normally what happens is in the spring, the ice melts, the water's high as the summer goes on, the lake gets lower and lower and lower and lower to the point where oftentimes in literally in August, our dock will only be, say, a foot deep at the end of the dock as opposed to four feet deep in the spring. So that's that just gives you sort of an idea. Well, this year, even in August, the lake is at springtime levels. What does that have to do with the shower and the bathroom in the camp. Well, <laughs> the water table is so high and the ground is so saturated that the septic system is not working. So that means if you flush the potty, the water won't even go down. And if you take a shower, there's no place for the water to go if you're trying to have it go out the drain. So no potty, no shower. And to solve this problem, because we have various family members still trying to use the camp, we've brought in a porta potty. And, you know, they come and they empty it once a week. And, but at the end of the day, it's still a porta potty. And it can get hot in there and it doesn't smell great. And if you've ever used a porta potty, you kind of know what that's all about. So, Anyway, we're at the cabin in Vermont, and, and those are the situations. Uh, but then there, there were a couple other things. Number one, uh, the way our cabin is situated, it's on this beautiful little point on Lake Champlain, and the cabin is only literally probably less than 50 feet from the water, which is nice. But um, if the wind in Vermont is coming from the south, that point protects our little cove, and the water can be like glass, and you can look out in the middle of the lake and see white caps, which is great. But when the wind comes out of the north, which is about 50% of the time, that point doesn't protect us, and we get, literally, we can have white caps crashing on our little beach area, which makes the lake essentially worthless for any lake activities. There's no, when, when that's the situation, there's no fishing. There's no water skiing. There's no power boating. You see the sailboats out there loving it, but you know we don't have a sailboat, and I don't sail, and if you were to take a power boat out in that that you would normally say ski behind, you just get beat to death by the waves. So we had a couple of days while we were there of the north wind, which made life just kind of miserable, not to mention that it comes right off the lake. There's no trees. There's nothing to break the wind. So if you're outside, <laughs> you're, you're getting the wind in your face. And when it's going 15, 20 miles an hour, it's 
It, it's not fun. Uh, and we like to have campfires in the evening and you, you can't do that either. So, but when we didn't have the north wind, uh, on a couple of days, we had rain. And because of the rain that they had the week before we were there, because of the rain earlier this summer, and then when it was raining while we were there, the yard just turned into mud. So you walk out in the yard and you're, it's coming over the sides of, you know, I was wearing like outdoor sandals. What's well, coming over the sides of my sandals? And we have a nice grass lawn and normally in August it's rock hard, but not this year. So between the rain and the wind and the mud, uh, the fact that uh, even when the lake was usable, the fishing was terrible. I mean, we, we couldn't catch a fish to save our lives. And I'm usually pretty good fisherman when I'm up there. I Last, last August, I caught four or five really nice bass. And my buddy Gary and I go up there, and, and we have killed it in August. But this year... I couldn't catch a fish to save my life, except on the last day, I went out to the dock before I took down my fly rod and put it in the car, and I threw it out there, and lo and behold, a little smallmouth bass kept me from going zero for the whole week, so I caught one fish. One fish. Mm. On top of all that, we've got some family problems. Um, my sister, who who lives in the Northeast, is going through a severe bout of depression Uh, it's basically it's not just sadness and she's been been dealing with some mental health issues for a long time but but she's just about incapacitated by what she's going through right now and I'm not going to share all of her all of her struggles but um, it is um, it's become a an issue within her family to the point where it's pretty much starting to disintegrate unless a miracle happens. And so my sister joined us for dinner um, the first night that we were there. And uh, it was, it was kind of depressing. It was, it was just difficult. I felt, I I empathized with her. I feel sorry for her. Uh, My parents were there and I think they were really happy to have the whole family together for for a dinner out and we were celebrating their 65th wedding anniversary. Congrats, mom and dad. Um, but my sister is having such a, such a tough time that, um, that made that not like a really cheery, happy dinner. Let's, let's just leave it at that. Um, and again, this is all, this is all my vacation, right? (laughs) The mud, the wind, (laughs) no fishing, the porta potty, uh, the, the, the dinner out. And then I, I, I have to mention my poor mother is getting old and frail. She's 88. Um, she's having some issues with her eyesight. She's, uh, she is hard of hearing, and she's got very significant uh, sciatic issues with her back, and so walking is almost impossible for her. Uh, but she decided, bless her heart, that she wanted to come up to camp to be there with us while we were there. Uh, even though uh, she knew that she wasn't going to be able to participate the way that she has for years and years. You know, a typical day, mom and dad are up there, the cousins are up there, my aunt and uncle are there, you know, we'll have people running all around. And, you know, my mom and my aunt would traditionally cook big dinners and we'd serve it all out on the picnic table and everybody, you know, it was, it was just, you know, it was the way things were growing up. And even even when my kids were little, it was it was still like that. Um, and now my mom is, you know, she goes and she sits on the couch and you sit and visit with her to the extent that you can, but, but she can't hear. And so it's difficult to, to carry on a, a long conversation, um, of any, anything other than small talk. Um, and so that, that was, uh, I was glad to see my mom, but if I went fishing, I felt really guilty. I got to tell you, uh, on the, and then you, you finally get the waves to settle down or rain to stop. And you're like, well, I kind of want to catch a fish while I'm here. So, you know, we did fish and, uh, but then I was feeling, feeling guilty the whole time for not trying to, to be better sitting with my, with my mom. And, you know, she's just, she's, she's extremely frail. And just when I compare how she is now to how she was last summer at this time, it's that it, she's really declined quite a lot. And, um, I don't mind sharing that with you, but uh, again, that's that's just difficult. 
And then uh, my wife, Mary, was with us. And on the on the day before we left, uh, her sister started emailing that her father was having uh, some congestive heart issues and that that he might be in heart failure. And they were rushing him to the doctor to find out uh, if he was having a heart attack or whatever. And uh, it turned out that he he is having some issues, but it wasn't nearly as concerning as some of the test results showed. So by the time we got there, um, he was he was doing okay, and and her mother is also old um, and having some uh, some some old age related issues, just a, a little bit of of uh, of memory loss and that type of thing. Well, then as soon as we got to camp, her mother was getting an infusion. Um, for for one of her conditions, and she went into heart failure, and they rushed her to the hospital, and the next day inserted three stents in her artery because she had an 80% blockage. So all of this is going on. We're getting these texts. By this time, Mary and I are at camp dealing with the wind, the rain, the mud, the porta potty <laughs> and the terrible fishing. And, and, and then her, you know, she was upset because her mother was, was going through all of this and everything came out fine. Uh, they inserted the stents. She was in the hospital for two nights and she's home and everything is good, but we're getting updates from family members and we're trying to decide, should we leave camp and go back and check on them? They live about three hours from there. Um, and ultimately we decided we would not, but then because of the rain, we wound up leaving uh, a day early because there was nothing left to do but sit in the camp and, and watch it rain. And we we wanted to stop and check on Mary's mother, but um, her dad texted us back and said, no, the uh, everything's been very stressful and uh, we know you guys mean well, but we, we just don't need the extra company right now. You know, I get that. I get that. So anyway, uh, the the saving grace uh, out of out of all these things that were going on was that we did find some time uh, in the wind and out of the rain to do four really good bike rides um, of around 20 miles each. One was a couple of them were 30 miles. Um, and and the most fun one was we took our bikes on the car to Burlington, Vermont, which if you've never been to Burlington, it's one of the greatest little cities in the world. It's right on Lake Champlain and it's about an hour from our cabin. And they have a greenway, which turns into a causeway, which is an old railroad line that goes out across Lake Champlain. So you're riding along and the lake is on either side of you. uh, And the trail is just wide enough for, say, I don't even know if it's wide enough to take like a Jeep out on it. But it's, it's, it's let's say it's as wide as a car and it goes right out into the middle of the lake. And then they made a cut in the rail line so boats could pass through. And then uh, what the, what is there is something called the bike ferry. And you put your bike on this ferry. It's basically a huge pontoon boat. It'll carry like 20 bicycles and, and the riders. And they take you across the cut. And then you take your bike off and you continue along on the causeway into the town of South Hero, which is on a huge island in the middle of Lake Champlain. And by huge, I mean there's towns on the island. There's farms. And, you know, it's, like, it's got roads and highways, and it's, uh, it's really cool. And so we went in. We found a vineyard, and we did a wine tasting, and uh, it was pretty good. And then we got on our bikes, and we rode back, and we did the bike ferry back across the cut, and we rode back into Burlington and had a nice lunch, and, and everything was, you know, it was just fun. And and that was uh, just a tremendous, tremendous day. Uh, although I will tell you that um, a storm front was coming through, and as we were riding back, we were riding directly into 20-mile-an-hour winds. So our friend the wind was there. So thank you for for listening uh, to me talk about my vacation. Why am I telling you all of this? Well, it it was a lot of adversity, and it was coming from every direction, right? I mean, my mom and dad, uh, my sister, Mary's mom and dad, the uh the wind the, all the other all the other you know <laughs> first world problems i was telling you about uh, the rain and all of that and the, the, the porta potty um but i realized that even though i have 
sarcoidosis and I'm not as nimble as I once was and I've talked about all the issues that I have with Sark. Uh, and honestly, I do have a shorter fuse than I did 10 years ago, and it, it still pisses me off pretty much on a daily basis that I have Sark. But I had to look around and say, look, my problems are not nearly as bad as those of my mother, of, of Mary's parents, and even my dad, who's 88 years old and is very healthy, but he's my mother's primary caregiver. And, and she needs a, a lot of care, as I just described. Um, so you, you look around and you say, yeah, you know, the sarcoidosis, and I know a lot of you have it way worse than me, um, but for me, it was just sort of a, a, a good comparison of where I'm at versus uh, the folks around me who are very near and dear to me. And I, and I will tell you that my job at the TV station has been very stressful of late. I mean, TV news always is. A friend of mine describes it as the only business in the world where everybody runs around all day with their hair on fire. Um, and that's true. That's just day-to-day -day TV news. But we are working through some philosophical changes in the newsroom. And I think they're good ones, but change is always difficult. And that has led to a bunch of turmoil and a bunch of unhappy people. And so... I really needed this vacation. You know, for a couple of months, I've been dreaming of fishing during the day, and then I go for a bike ride in the middle of the day, and then coming back and resting up before we have a campfire in the evening, a cold beer, and watching the sunset over the lake, and and uh, the campfire. And I, I mean, it's just it's when that works out, it's perfect. But instead, things were pretty much as I just described. So I am mourning the loss of the vision that I had for my time away. Uh, and I am, I can, as I speak to you now, I am not more rested and relaxed than when I left. So great. Yes, that's just great. But look, the fact is that you just got to keep plugging, right? Uh, I look at Sark in perspective compared to the issues that my loved ones are facing that doesn't necessarily make it any easier. You know, my feet still tingle and I'm still clumsy and I still can't run. But, you know, it's not as bad as what I'm seeing around me. Um, and it doesn't it does. When you look and you see people who have it worse, it does give you that dose of perspective perspective, which means you just need to buckle down. I need to try and figure out how to help where I can, because. There's this expression everywhere that if you're feeling down, the best thing to do to help yourself is to help somebody else, right? You've heard that. And then just make the best of the time that I have while I can do what it is that I want to do, right? I mean, I look at, you know, we're all going to wind up in the same place at the end, and my parents are, are closer to that than I am. And I've talked about, you know, people who've, uh, had a you know a tough run with sarcoidosis, and we've talked to people who've lost family members and uh, to Sark. And um, if you remember, uh, I I did a riff earlier this year about a friend of mine, an acquaintance really, more than a friend, who was he he had terminal cancer, and he knew that that he wasn't going to make it. And towards the end, he he lamented the loss of living every day according to his plans like just a day where you get up and say all right i'm going to do this i'm going to do this i'm going to do this and you know i've got a to-do list and you know i'm going to go to work or i'm going to mow the lawn and um and as he got sicker and sicker he was unable to live every day according to his plans and so that to me says to the extent that i can i want to continue to to plan my day out and then go out and do it. And just being able to do that is a blessing. So I do what I can to keep sarcoidosis at bay. Uh, I try to contribute to the greater good to the best as best I can through my job, through public service commitments on local boards and charities and with those people around me. And uh, to a certain extent, even, even with this podcast, which is a, a volunteer effort through FSR. So if you can continue to, to do those types of things, if I can continue to do that, I'm going to call it a win. And those are my thoughts for this podcast. 
The official Sark Fighter song is called Zombie by Mark Steyer and his band, the White Hot Lizards. Hear Mark's story and the story behind the lyrics in episode 12. This podcast is released every other Monday. As I'm speaking today, my trusty dog, Dougal, is not curled up in the chair in my office because, once again, Mary is working from home. So he's cheating on me, and he's down in her office. I don't think there's ever been a time, Dougal, I'm speaking to you, when if both of us are home, you're up here with me. And don't think I haven't noticed. (laughs) The backstory to the founding of the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is episode 11 with Andrea and Redding Wilson. And you can follow me on social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram. I'm on Peloton. Just search for Sark Fighter on all of those. My cycling blog, Carl and the Cyclist, has a section called Cycling with Sarcoidosis. You might want to check that out. If you are new here and just trying to figure out what sarcoidosis is, welcome. And I would suggest you try listening to episode two with Dr. Simon Hart. I kind of call that my sarcoidosis 101 episode. My backstory is episode one. You can send me an email, and I love hearing from you. It's in the show notes as well, but it's carlinagency at gmail.com. And it helps me reach more people and grow the podcast if you share it on your social media. And if you like it, just tell one other person. So please subscribe and give the show a nice review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your downloads. Until next time, keep fighting.